it's good to be here this morning with all of you. We're in the uh, series of Ephesians, um, the triumphant life for believers in Christ, learning to sit, walk, stand in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. My question is this, who still has their memory verse from last week? I want to know if anybody memorized it, because we're, today's a pop quiz. Pop quiz, anybody memorize it? Let's hear, anybody? Anybody? Can anybody throw us out, throw it out there? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's our verse. That's a reason why we have this verse, so you would lock it in and memorize I carried it with me. Thank you, sir. Uh, scripture tells us about memorizing Scripture, and it is strategic because there are times when you're like, I don't really remember, I don't really know, or just that, and it anchors it back in. You know when you're at your home and all of a sudden you got this song that you can't get out of your head? We want that to happen with Scripture, where you can't get it out of your head, and as life's circumstances arise and things come up, that that verse and another verse or any verse rolls around in your head. Rather than having any sort of secular version of speaking into your life, we want God's Word speaking into your life in the highs and lows of your journey. So that's why... That's what I believe why we do it, right? Amen. Yes, amen. All right, amen? Amen. Okay, that was in my notes to check on your memory verse. Okay, last week we walked through the first chapter of Ephesians, and uh, where Paul was having his move that bus moment, if you remember. And if you're with us online, welcome. Come in sometime and say hi. Um, we're glad you're out there, but we'd love to have you here too. Uh, but Paul has his move that bus moment, giving us that what we call the grand kind of cosmic picture of what God's doing in this world. And in chapter one, there's an identity piece that he instills in us as followers of Jesus, where he calls us, he says he chose us before the creation of the world. He predestined us for the adoption, sonship. Uh, we were redeemed through his blood, verse 7. Forgiveness of sins is something that we get. Rich, riches of God's grace that he lavishes, not just gives us, lavishes on us, verse 8. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. And then you were marked with a seal by the Holy Spirit. And then we looked at this um, where God the Father initiated and God the Son accomplished and then God the Holy Spirit applies what this actually means in God's move that bus grand scheme of what he's doing in our world and what he's doing in the lives of believers. Now we get to chapter 2. Paul brings us to this overarching theme as Jane was sharing this, little, this morning a little bit about salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Human effort, human goodness are completely ineffective. And yet, as that's said over and over again, people still work to merit God's favor and God's blessing, God's grace through how we live and how we act and what we do. But it says in Scripture that that's ineffective. Human effort, human goodness, completely ineffective in our salvation. There's nothing that I can say. There's no side connection that I can have. There's no, uh, we'll let this one slide. When it comes to salvation... It's not a birthright. It's not a reward. It's a gift. Nobody earns it. It's given. And when you, when you sit with that reality, you realize, I have nothing that can get me this. Nothing. I mean, that, that, that is a stark reality. I can be actually, out of, out of 1 to 100, I can be on the 99 of goodness. But... Still not good enough, because that's not how it works. Completely different. It's a gift. And that takes us from verse 1 to verse 10 in chapter 2. And then Paul transitions to focus on the idea of unity in Christ for the rest of the chapter. And this includes the tearing down of the previous divide between Jews and Gentiles, and that now there is one big spiritual family in Christ. And that's really a summary. So this morning, we're going to focus on the first half of that chapter and really drill down on one particular verse, verse 10, which was repeated a couple times this morning in prayer and in worship, 
which is actually is one of my uh, personal anchor verses in life that I love to reflect on is Ephesians 2, 10. I think I even cited it last week. So before we jump in the passage, I'm going to pray and we're going to read through the first 10 verses and then we're going to ask the Lord to open our eyes to this. So will you join me in prayer? Father, we come to you this morning and we ask that you guide and lead us as we open your word, as churches across the world are opening your word (coughs) this day, and you would illuminate our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our souls, to see what it is you'd have us see, and that we would be encouraged, convicted, um, strengthened, admonished, challenged in a way that causes us to live more aligned with Christ, more in Christ, more in the design that you have called and predestined us to. So we just commit this morning to you, illuminate our eyes, we pray as we read your scriptures in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to read through the first 10 verses here in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, I'm reading from the NIV. I realize the Pew Bible might be a little different. Ephesians 2, starting verse 1. It says, As for you, you were dead in your, trespass, in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace You've been saved. And God raises, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In verse 10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And that's what we're going to focus on. So I'm going to walk us through a little bit of those first 10 verses and a little bit just to begin to understand it because there's so much. Again, Ephesians, we could spend a year in Ephesians, but I really want to highlight <coughs> excuse me, specific pieces to this. Verse 1 starts out pretty harsh when you think about it by stating that before Christ, before Christ existed in this, in this story, we're dead. We're guilty. We're guilty before we even started. We are guilty in our sins and our trespasses. Literally guilty, dead, lost, completely disconnected from a holy God as we had previously walked following the ways of Satan and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's what he says in verse, verse 1. Literally, that, that, that I am disconnected. There's a holy God and somebody who is not holy. And all it takes is one thing for me to not be holy and disconnected from God. And the only thing that can actually reconnect me, give me presence with a holy God, is some type of covering, which is the whole theme of Jesus coming into this world. But prior to that, just to sit with the anchor of reality of without Jesus, I am dead, I'm lost, I'm completely disconnected and deserving of wrath. He says, deserving of wrath. The Bible talks about this in Romans 5, that before Christ, in our sins, we were not just deserving of wrath, we were enemies of God. I mean, that is a harsh reality to think of enemies, because when I think of enemies, I think of, you know, bad guys with guns that are against me. And now I look at this, and the scriptures say that, that before Christ, I was actually enemies with God, that, the, that my ways and my preferences, my agenda, my system of thought rooted in this sinful nature is counter to who God is. And Romans says that makes us an enemy of God, which is just so hard to sit with. But that's what makes grace so powerful. Then it says in verse 4 and 5 where it says this, it says, but because of his 
great love for us. And last week we talked about how he lavished grace on us. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich, like deeply rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. Because it's by his grace that we're saved. If we just sat with that, I mean, that is so much right there that he made us alive because of his great love, because of his richness in mercy made us alive. Even while I was dead, even while I was lost, even while I was still in that way of sin, he made that pathway for me. It speaks to how great God is and how beautiful his mercy is towards us. This is Paul's first mention of being saved by grace. Then he gets to one of the most well-known passages in the Bible in verse 8 and 9, where he emphasizes salvation by grace through faith. It's not a result anything that you do. He says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, not in and of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And <clears throat> he says that because I think it's a mindset that says, I can do this. I can earn this. I can achieve this. Give me the benchmark. Tell me what I need to do. And as far as I think I can go, I don't go far enough. And he reiterates it by saying, not of yourselves and not of works. It's not anything you can do. It's not anything you can inherit. This passage addresses the long-held notion that God accepts good people and rejects bad people. Oh, you're bad and you're good. And that's not how it works. Most people, whether in Christianized countries or those steeped in other religions, usually operate under the idea that God accepts or rejects people based on the level of goodness or their religious performance. It is steeped all over culture and in other religions. And Ephesians 2 makes it painfully clear that that's not the case. It's through His grace, His unwarranted, overwhelming favor that He offers us something like this. This story hits so close to me, this passage hits so close to me as a, as a, as a kid growing up. Because I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, everything we did in our home was my father was a pastor of a large church in Southern California. And so I grew up in this Christian home. And everything that we did in our home was Christian. Everything. We went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. Did anybody else, do you remember doing that back in the day? They don't have that anymore, but that's what we did. It was every week. You didn't miss and we had, we had Bible verses. I was in Boys Brigade. It was just like the Christian version of Boy Scouts. And my sister was in Pioneer Girls, which is the Christian version of Girl Scouts. And we, everything we did, we watched Christian TV. Horrible, but Christian TV. We only were allowed to listen to Christian music. When we had friends over, they had to, we were wondering, are they Christian? Everything was about being Christian. And in fact, in the home that I grew up, as my father is a Baptist minister, the home that I grew up, I grew up where... We had a set of rules that we lived by because we were Christian. We called them the nine nasties. These are the nine things you don't do because you're Christian. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew. I remember, I didn't know what chew meant when I was a kid. And I remember looking at my brother like, we don't chew? He goes, I don't know, just swallow, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. We're choking. Don't chew. It's, we're Christian. See, see what I mean? It doesn't make sense, right? It's just crazy. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't go to movies, we didn't play cards, we didn't drink, we didn't go to dances, uh, we didn't go cruising, we didn't hang out with girls that did those things. I mean, all these nine nasties of things that we didn't do because we're Christian. <laughs> the two things, funny. Um, I remember as a kid growing, growing up in that where my friends would say, we're going to go to the, there's a dance at school. I went to public school. There's a dance at school. And, we're, and there's, we want to go to the dance. Everybody's going to the dance. And that was the thing. We're all going to the dance. Everybody's getting ready to go to the dance. I'm like, I, asking me if I'm going to dance. I'm like, I, I can't. Why? Because I'm a Christian. And I remember arguing with my father. Why can't we go to the dance? And my dad would say, and if Baptist had a tone, it would be like this. He would say, dancing stimulates the lust of the flesh. And I'm like, we know. That's why we like it. I'm just being honest, right? But no, we can't do that because we're Christian. Ugh. And I remember also, we weren't allowed to go to movies. My dad wouldn't allow us to go to movies. And, uh, and I remember arguing with him. 
insane. I remember the first movie I saw was Raiders of the Lost Ark. I snuck out when I was 17 to go see it with Robert Schuler, his daughter, Carol Schuler. Two pastor's kids sneaking out to see the bad movie. Going to the movie. But we weren't allowed to go to movies. And I remember arguing with my dad because my friends were like, hey, we're going to go to the movies. Can you want to go to the movies? And I'm like, I can't. Why? Because I'm a Christian. And I remember arguing with my dad. And my dad would say, in a Baptist tone, whatever that means, he would say, son, what if you're in the theater and Jesus returns? What happens then? I'm like, we won't get to see the rest of the movie? <laughs> like, that, that's, that was my thought process, right? Like, am I thinking my dad and in the process of this whole thing, I'm thinking, I can't go to the movies because uh, I'm a Christian. And I grew up a, a little bit of that where I didn't necessarily grapple with grace, I grappled with behavior. And I think a lot of people do that, that my salvation and my connection to Jesus has everything to do with sin management rather than recognizing I have nothing and I rely on grace. It changes it all. Yeah, do I, do I, do I think my, my parents were doing what they thought was right? I get that. But for me, recognizing that grace is what God connects me to through Christ. And I accept it by faith and walk in that journey. I remember the thing that caused me to realize this whole pattern of sin management was watching my dog. I had a family dog. Her name was Sugar. And I remember Sugar. We were, I was in the, the den watching, probably watching Christian TV. And my dog comes walking across and lays down. And I thought, Sugar's a Christian. She has to be, because she doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't play cards, and there are dogs that do, because I've seen that picture. Do you know what I'm talking about? So you know what I'm talking about, right? And that's when, in my mind, I'm like, this isn't about sin management. My motivating factor is out of, the, out of like, humble goodness to the fact that God saved me. He offered grace when I didn't deserve it. And I think we get caught up in the things that we don't do that become this activator for how we live our Christian faith. It's fascinating that works makes its way back into the church. It does all the time. He's a good Christian. Well, why, why is he a good Christian? What makes him good? You mean he's a good God that made him in Christ? That, is that what you mean? Not the bad Christian, the good Christian. That doesn't make sense. It's grace. It's unmerited. It's, it's, it's unwarranted. It, we don't deserve any of it. And yet it's lavished on us. And yeah, sin management and really trying to work through walking closer to Christ, my motivation now is not so I am, am a good Christian, because then it goes back into a works model. My motivation for changing my behavior is because God is so good, and He wants the best for me. He wants the best in me. He wants so much. He sees Christ in me. That's what grace is. Game changer. The whole thing game changes when I get out of sin management mode. By grace, you've been saved. Salvation didn't come through anything I did. It did not come from being good, acting more Christian. It does not come from sin management. It comes, from, it comes in the form of grace. And my response is, I believe that. I put my faith in that. I trust in that. There's all kinds of things I can trust in. That's what I trust in. That's what faith is. I didn't do anything. I just looked at it and said, I don't deserve it, but I'll take it. By grace, you've been saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift. And then we get to verse 10, and this is my anchor verse. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love the language of this verse, because when it's put into context, it becomes eye-opening to every believer being activated in the Christian life. Activated. 
Not passive, not like, I got my insurance, I'm good with God. It's activated for what God has intentionally designed for each one of you. We are God's workmanship or artwork and have been created to do good works. In fact, God prepared in advance for believers to con- uh, accomplish these tasks. That blows my mind that, that in the future, later today, when I leave this building tomorrow, this week, God has put things in place uniquely for me. That's like a key, very specific, in a lock that only that key can open. That's what he's calling us to. So when you recognize that grace, you didn't deserve it, and you got it, and it's huge, it's lavished on you, and now he wants to activate you into his kingdom, into the th- work and the things that he does. The word workmanship is a pretty loaded term that's appearing one other time in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where it describes God's handiwork in creation and in nature. And in Ephesians 2.10, workmanship describes God's handiwork, describing our unique human conditioning, hardwiring. Romans 1 points out God's creation. Romans 10 points out God's recreation. That's us. The first refers to the physical work of God in the world, and the second refers to the spiritual work of God in our lives. Workmanship. Workmanship also describes a transformational change. When God saves us by His grace, there's change in purpose, there's change in values, there's change in this outlook on life, and our worldview changes. Sin is easier to walk away from because my values have been restructured in light of the one who's offered grace. See, when when you put it in order and you really sit with grace, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. And what we do, churches do, I have done, flip it. And it just kills it. It makes grace cheap. Being God's workmanship is a transformation into my very nature, which literally goes hand in hand with our memory verse that we had last week, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, you're a new creature. Those old things, they just pass away. New things new adventures, new excitement, new things for God to activate in your life have come. See how it all fits? We didn't even make, we didn't plan this. Did you plan that? I didn't plan it. Oh, yeah, I plan oh all right. Well, I get it then. <laughs> so you're in my head then. I get it. It's a conspiracy. Oh, that's good. Thank you. That was funny. I was getting a little passionate here. Um, so we're his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus, not our, re- our reworking or redoing, but doing what God's doing in Christ Jesus, to do good works, to do the things that impact this world, which God prepared in advance for you to do. He's already laid it out because of who I am in Christ, saved by grace. God's transformed me. I'm a new creation. Now we set up a, a, this adventurous life. And I call it the adventurous life because I don't have any, cl- there, there's no, God doesn't like download an agenda in my Outlook calendar. What he does is he calls me to be awake and to be sensitive to the Spirit. And the Spirit prompts things, as we talked about last week. He, the Spirit is activating things in our lives. And as I'm open to the Spirit activating things in my life, all of a sudden the next conversation I have is literally designed for what God's doing in this world. The next conversation, the next opportunity, the next thing, I begin to discern and begin to see what are those specific things that God has uniquely for me. He activates it. Where I do His good work, which He set for me to do. So I want to challenge you with these two things and then share a little story. First is this. First is this. Do you believe it? Because I think we verbally assent to it. But do you believe it? Belief affects behavior. Now, I can just say, I think that's great. I could say I'm a Christian. I could say I'm in Christ, but I don't behave that way. Does it actually modify and change my behavior? Do I believe that I'm uniquely formed by God to do something in this lifetime, 
not something that I did earlier, in this lifetime, as in when I leave the building here today, that he's planned out for you. Do you believe it? I'm going to amen all by myself. Do you believe it? Okay. Sometimes. Sometimes it's hard. Thank you for saying sometimes. Because sometimes you're like, I don't get it. This doesn't make sense. Because that's what faith is. Faith makes no sense. I'm supposed to believe in something I can't see? Like, I have more faith sometimes in the car driving the opposite direction, and I have faith and hope that he's going to stop when the light turns red. That's faith. I don't even know him. I never met him. I don't know if he's a good driver. I don't even know his name. But I have faith he's going to do it. That's, that, that's how faith kind of plays out. Well, faith in what God is doing in our lives, sometimes you're like, man, sometimes this is hard. But it's a muscle that you have to exercise or it will atrophy. Exercising my faith to say, God, what do you want to do in me today? And part of that is being open to that in the morning. Wake up in the morning. Whatever your morning routine is, add this in the routine. God, what do you have for me today to activate my faith? To activate good works activate what you've prepared for me to do. Open my eyes to see that. And then let your journey begin. I say this all the time. When your life gets disrupted, meaning you're not ready for, like, something happens. Like, I'm going to work and there's a roadblock. Or it's going, this situation happened. Buckle up. Because he's using you. He's getting your attention. It's not about your rights, your ways, your agenda, your preferences, your schedule. It's about his and him activating you as his workmanship. Do you believe it? Second is, will you activate it? Will you activate, will you willingly take the step of faith that says, God, I embrace and embody the masterpiece that you've created. Use me this week in your timing, your will, and your purpose for the sake of your kingdom. Philippians 2 says this, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to to fulfill his good purpose. Philippians tells us that. Let me tell you what I think happens when we actually believe when we are his workmanship, when we walk in that reality, when we actually take that step of faith. What I believe is Jesus actually shows up. Not, not literally, but he shows, his show, like the, the work of Jesus shows up when I am activated. The work of Jesus. Jesus shows up. I remember at uh, my old church, we were doing projects where we had somebody, and I was telling our team, I'm like, we, we've, been, we've been gifted in our church with construction people, people that have, can manage construction projects, do irrigation, uh, uh, doing the re-roofing, sheetrock, all, all, I mean everything. Everything to rebuild a house. For some reason, our ministry had all those people in those specific fields of work. And I'm like, this is like a superpower for us. This is something that we can do. God's created us as his workmanship. We're going to do this in our world together. And we had an opportunity out in um, north San Jose. There's an area called Alviso. A small little area. And some of the homes are pretty, pretty beaten up. We were invited by the city council to say, hey, would you guys help us redo a home? Kind of like Extreme Makeover, very much like that. And so we're like, yes, we would love to do that because we felt like, man, we're being activated in our faith. We're being activated by God. This is an awesome thing. I had some other projects going on. This is through a thing called Beautiful Day. I had these other projects going on. I had one person that was leading that project that we were going to redo this house from top to bottom, like literally, not knock it down, but just like they were going to have a completely different house. We were going to have a move that bus moment. It was going to be awesome. So we worked on it, worked on it all week, did all these things, new lawn, new roof, re-irrigation, some drywall on the side, did some all, I mean, just major construction. It was a completely different place. But on the last day, the very last two days before the project was over, um, our, our painter, our team that was going to paint, had to cancel on us. So when you do a home and you do a complete makeover and you've done all these cool things and it's not painted, it kind of kind of kills the whole thing. You're like, no, no, it's, it's really cool inside. You know what I mean? It's, it just doesn't have the same effect. And I remember the foreman on our team 
guy I was working with and discipling, he said, John, uh, 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 this, this happened. Here's our, our, uh, our foreman for painting canceled on us. I'm like, oh, man. And I said, well, let's just pray, man. We just, yeah, we need Jesus to show up because we've been doing this and acting out in faith. And so we're just praying, God, just, we just need you to show up. Will you show up and will you show us something? And so we went back, and you know, he's going back and doing some things. Well, there was nearby that house, there were some construction workers that were doing another project, completely unrelated to what we were doing. And they'd been watching us all week doing this project. And they came over, they said, hey, why aren't you painting the house? He said, well, our, our painter's canceled on us, so we're trying to figure that out. They're like, we're painters. Can we, can we paint the house? And he's like, absolutely. These guys do the whole thing. And afterwards, we were celebrating and talking to them. And one of the guys, the foreman, asked him, he said, you know, remind, me, remind me your names again. I kid you not, this is what their names. First guy's name was Moses. <laughs> Second guy's name was Israel. And the third guy's name was Jesus. Now, he went by Jesus, but it's spelled like Jesus. <laughs> and so my foreman calls me, he said, I said, how's it going? He said, Jesus showed up. I said, I know, we've been praying about it. I said, no, he's right here. He's right here right now. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, I'm telling you, Jesus is here. <laughs> yeah, who knew? Jesus is a short little guy and Mexican guy in El Viso. Goes by Jesus. But it was, it was almost God's humor to say, I got you. Live this adventurous life. Be activated. I have lavished so much grace on you. Be empowered to be what I've designed you to be. And we sit back and we laugh about that and we're reminded Jesus does show up with Moses and Israel. But he does show up. And he shows himself to us. Let me read that passage one more time. Verse 8 and 9. For it's by grace... God's grace. You've been saved. You didn't deserve it, but he gave it to you. It's activated through faith. By grace you've been saved. Not of yourselves, nothing you could do. No goodness, no favor, just God's grace. Not of works, lest anyone boast. And from that, we are his workmanship. His masterpiece. That he wants to activate Created in Christ Jesus to do good works that only you can do. That key and that lock, when we leave this building, is activate us in this world. And when that happens, friends, Jesus shows up. He does unbelievable things in our adventurous life. So with that, will you join me in prayer and we'll close our teaching time here. Father, thank you for the opportunity to just share from your word and that we would be challenged by it, motivated, reminded, humbled by it, by your grace and activated through faith in this workmanship that you created for us to do. Bless us this week as we leave this building after we have our time of closing that we would be activated for your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.